Thank you for the introduction, and thank you for being here instead of the last talk of this day. Uh, I'm going to present to you my master thesis uh, about simulating hurricanes and bunnies. Uh, and whenever I say bunnies, I mean arbitrary genus zero closed surfaces. And uh, I use closed surfaces because I hate boundaries, also privately. Uh, and I'm going to start with some appetizer fluid dynamics, uh, nice and spicy, then put some surface theory on this for the fluids to be on the surfaces, and then have some sweet results as a dessert. So let's get started with motivation. This here is a fluid simulation constrained in the box. And what we see are the marker particles, the blue ones, that are being injected on the left here. But actually, the velocity field is computed everywhere at every time step. And as we can see, it's very turbulent. Turbulence is just another fancy word for chaotic. And in the sense of fluid dynamics, it means that these equations usually create way too much uh, very unpredictable, numerically <coughs> unstable flows. And not unstable, but uh, hard to predict if you want to do a simulation to find out where something was flowing inside the river at night you will have a problem because the river will probably be very turbulent and you will not know what happened because your simulation will not be as real life but nevertheless um, we see patterns in here and we can see these worlds the center of these worlds going around and especially at the, at the end we see very big worlds here and there and over there and if we stop the simulation, we, and we try to describe the picture, we can either describe the picture by giving, telling me the velocity field at every point, or you describe the picture to me by telling, oh, there's this world here, and it's kind of has the strength here, it's the vorticity, we call this. And also in this image, uh, you would, I think it's more natural to, to speak to try to describe this image, the velocity field, by uh, talking about these worlds. And this is exactly what we want to do. We want to only talk about these worlds. We want to know where these worlds are moving next, the next time step. And we want to forget the rest of the fluid, because this is way too much information. It's hard to compute anyway, because it's a lot of data. And this is a sort of reduction of the fluid problem onto just worlds of different sizes. And this is what uh, Gustav Kirchhoff did in 1891. And he did this for the two-dimensional case on the plane. But we want to go beyond that. Uh, and one motivation is the jet proportion that we just saw. This creates these worlds that we see. Uh, when you are on a bridge and you look into the water and you can see water flowing past the column of the bridge, you will probably see vortex shedding. You will see uh, these uh, Worlds alternating behind the column, uh, and also if you have if you drink your coffee and you stir it around, you have little bubbles or you have a miso soup, then you will have uh, spinning points, uh, rapidly spinning points, and uh, you you will see them move around. Those are all also point vortices, and the surface of your coffee is two uh, D surface, a two D fluid simulation, and if Earth is flat or spherical or bunny shape, it doesn't matter. We, we want to see how these hurricanes affect each other and how they move on the planet. And this is exactly what, we, what I will try to answer in this talk. Uh, how can we just describe 2D fluid dynamics using only point vortices? And how can we gener generalize this to closed surfaces of genus zero, for example, the bunny? Uh, so first off, we're going to try to start out with very basic fluid dynamics. Imagine uh, a container with fluid, uh, and you take out a small piece with some mass and some volume, and you ask yourself, what are the forces acting on it? We want to describe the velocity field u. So we first start with basic physics toolbox, uh, f equals m times a. a is the change of the velocity field, and we want to model the velocity field, so that's a good start. But now we need to think about the forces which we want to apply to this fluid flow. Uh, and for first we have gravity, uh, very basic, everyone knows it. Then we have pressure. Pressure is the force resulting uh, from the fluid trying to not 
create or destroy itself. Basically, if you start making velocity arrows going into one area, uh, then basically there is velocity. Uh, if the velocity is supposed to describe the fluid, you either have to raise the density or the velocity uh, fluid is disappearing in that part. So it's either a seed or a source. And pressure is the one that will make sure that the fluid is preserved, that the volume of the fluid is preserved. Uh, and then there's also viscosity. And viscosity is friction. Like honey has a very high viscosity, and smoke uh, has very low viscosity. And if we do take this equation here, divide by the volume, and then take the infinitesimal limit of this, so we make the volume very small, we end up with the Navier-Stokes equation. And if you add together with the condition that it's supposed to be volume preserving, which ends up just being meaning that the velocity field is supposed to be divergence free. And if you manage to improve uh, uh, existence and smoothness of the, of the solution for these equations, then uh, you actually get a million dollars somewhere at some point. Uh, I didn't do that, but um, uh, we are too lazy, this is too complicated anyway. Uh, and we want to first simplify it. So we take density to be constant, which is fine, as long as you're not looking for acoustic waves or uh, inside water or air, pressure waves. Uh, we take gravity to be zero because we are looking at planets with very thin uh, surface fluids, basically. So there's not much degree of freedom up or down in our model, so we just keep the gravity zero. And we also don't like viscosity because it makes other things complicated. Also, we don't have the boundary because we're looking at planets that are closed up. So uh, a lot of simplifications. Now these, these, these equations are called the Euler equations, incompressible Euler equations. And now we want to talk about vorticity because we are talking about point vortex dynamics. And something important we have to understand is that if we put a piece of wood in a river, it's not just going to flow down the river. It's also going to rotate. But how is it going to rotate? Well, actually the, the term curl comes from that, because the vorticity is the curl of the velocity field. And this vector literally describes the rotation axis and also the rotation speed is defined by this. So if you have ever been surfing and got caught by a wave, then your vorticity vector would be going nuts. But uh, in this case, uh, this, this functions perfectly in 3D and in two dimensions when you only have a surface fluid, there's only one axis of rotation. So we can simplify it because our, we can set our axis of rotation always to be parallel to the normal of the surface. Meaning that, imagine this piece of wood going around the planet, uh, planet's oceans, it's going to just rotate like this, it's not going to rotate up and down. And uh, this is how we can define the scalar Vorticity. And from now on, we will use the scalar vorticity most of the time, uh, which is just by picking an oriented surface and picking that orientation. And then a positive vorticity means that you're moving uh, anti clockwise around the normal vector, and a negative vorticity means that you're moving around clockwise. Uh, and here are some examples of two dimensional vorticity field, uh, velocity fields that have constant vorticity in this case. So uh, a piece of wood would be rotating with the same angular rotation around the curve, no, ma no matter where you put it into this field. If you have a potential field, the curve of a gradient is always zero, and an object falling, following the uh, field lines of a potential field will not have any rotation, just like you would expect uh, gravity to not induce any rotation in the vacuum. And you can also add up different fields and this will be also important later um, when we have multiple different vortices acting, creating different vorticities. So we have this Euler equation, and it only talks about velocity, but we want to know more about vorticity because vorticity is the spinning thing in, uh, in our worlds. Uh, and what we just now do is we take some curl operator, we just drop it on the Euler equation, and we get a vorticity equation, and it has this funny looking extra term here that we don't have to care about because this is the vortex stretching term that only matters in 3D, but in 2D, since these two vectors are always orthogonal, it's just going to vanish. And the resultant equation here is the exact same equation 
that would describe what would happen if you color, add some color in the river, then this color is going to move along the flow. And this is what happens here. This is like the lead derivative. And the, it says that the vorticity uh, that you start with, and then you let it flow in the velocity field, will just flow along the velocity field lines. Okay? So, this will be important also for the point vortices because this will tell us the point vortices should move along the velocity field that they themselves induce. So a hurricane induces a velocity field, another hurricane induces another velocity field, and then they should be pushing each other. Okay, but now we have to do some quick maths because this is uh, unavoidable, sadly. Uh, if we have a two-dimensional fluid, we can define a stream function a function whose level sets are exactly these lines where a table tennis ball would, for example, flow down if you drop it into the fluid. And uh, we define a stream function as a scalar function which has the velocity field as the symplectic breakage. And this exists in 2D uh, when we have no uh, closed surface without boundary. And if you look at this, we have a gradient, so it's, it's the uh, the direction of the steepest and uh, highest accent uh, of the level set, and we do a 90 degree rotation, multiplying by a, a cross, doing a cross product with the normal vector, is like taking a normal vector, taking a tangent vector, and then the product will be a 90 degrees rotation of that tangent of that tangent vector. The this uh, radius is tangent to our surface, and then this is like a 90 degrees rotation. And if we now apply the curl again uh, onto this, we end up with a Poisson problem. This is uh, the, so the curl of the velocity field will uh, create our vorticity, and the curl of this thing will just end up being the Laplacian of the stream function. And Poisson problems have a lot of theory on how to solve them. In our case, we will need the Green's functions for that. Uh, and as a quick reminder, also we can write the phi as the integral of the Green's function with the vorticity. And the Green's functions are basically Poisson problem solutions uh, of Dirac delta functions. So this now gets a bit sticky, you know. But we will see how these Dirac delta functions fit perfectly into what we want to do. Um, so uh, let's go back to the what we were actually trying to look at. Um, we will now place n point vortices. We will call them P1 till Pn. They have their position. And every point vortex will be given a vortex strength, omega 1 to omega n. Uh, and now we want to see uh, how, do we, how do we model the vorticity in this. And the idea is that we look at vorticity sort of in, in, in this case, as a, in a slice, uh, we just see vorticity rising and lowering and going up and down in different places of the uh, of our field, of, of our velocity field. And what we now do is we basically uh, isolate the <coughs> centers of the worlds. These are the places where vorticity <coughs> is the strongest, uh, and ignore the rest. So the outside of these points, the <coughs> Velocity, the vorticity is basically irrotational because it's zero, but it's not going to be zero on these points, on these worlds. Uh, and what we just did is a smooth, as, as a transition from the smooth setting where vorticity is changing smoothly everywhere to a, a setting where we actually use Dirac, a linear combination of Dirac delta functions uh, at the positions of our uh, point vortices. And to, to recap, we have a relationship between the velocity field and the stream function. We have a way of writing the stream function in terms of the vorticity, and we have the vorticity as a sum of our point vortices, basically. So we can just plug this in here and this in here, and we should get a velocity form. And if we just do the math magic, bing, bing, this will go completely faster. And there, we end up with a formula that is valid, outside of the points uh, where, the, this should be, uh, where, the, uh, where the velocity is measured, uh, outside of the point vortices. Because 
when x is not in the point vortex, then this function will actually give us the velocity used by the hurricanes, basically. But the velocity in the hurricanes itself will have a problem because the Green's function evaluated with, on the same input twice, so with i equals j, will be not defined. So we have to think of something in order to circumvent that. And actually, I don't have to think about it. Kirchhoff did it. And he, he said in his assumption that these point vortices don't have any self-induction. Um, and so if we try to imagine uh, this red velocity field induced by one point vortex, and a blue velocity field induced by another point vortex, then we will want this entire red field to be shifted along the blue field, and vice versa. And since the red field is only defined by this dot here, we have to shift that dot. This is what matters. Uh, and this is the combined velocity field, what, what it should look like. And still here, using this formula, we don't have the velocities at the points themselves, so we don't know how to move these points. But Kirchhoff's assumption says that we just skip the self term. So we, because it's sort of like an infinite velocity in no direction, and this will be irrelevant. And what makes sense physically is to only allow the red point to move by the velocity field that all the other points induce onto it. And to make this more obvious, uh, think of planets and uh, especially point mass, so we could also have vortices which are bigger, but we only have point vortices, and if we think of point planets, and we want to compute the gravity acting on planet, planet 1, we would then take a sum of the gravity acted by every planet, except that we wouldn't take the, the force a planet exerts onto itself, because that's also a singularity. And this is actually what Kirchhoff does when he talks about uh, removing the self-induction from point vortices. It's, it's kind of redundant. Uh, so, uh, by the way, uh, I have to skip ahead there a bit. Uh, the, the kinetic energy of the fluid can be computed. It can be written also in terms of green functions like this. And then we can compute the velocity field at every point as the symplectic gradient of this Newtonian, this kinetic energy. And we are done. Only that the green function will still stab us in the moment. Uh, so the idea is that we take point vortices, we approximate the vorticity field, we use the vorticity field uh, to com compute the velocities on the point vortices, and then we advect the points uh, to new positions according to these velocities, and then we do this again. And this is our fluid simulation. Uh, so now let's try to apply this. For the plane, we have a green function. You can look it up in literature. For the sphere, also. Very complicated. But for the bunny, it's not clear at all. And actually, if I was going to rely on the green functions, I would fail. Because it's, they are very hard to compute. And it's, I just shifted the problem onto the green functions. But just let's go quickly back to the plane. So we can play, compute the symplectic gradient and get the same formula that Kirchhoff did back then. And this will create. Uh, this, this is how hurricanes would move if Earth was flat. Um, and next, we're going to see if Earth was a sphere, then we would have these uh, values for the Green function and its gradient. We would get this function. It was also uh, seen in a paper in 2015, and the hurricanes would move like this. So, by the way, these are uh, hurricanes with random vorticity strength. So, these are a bit weaker, but those are a bit stronger. And now, Especially pairs of uh, hurricanes like to propel each other forward in geodesics, actually, if they got very close. Uh, and next, for the closed surface, we don't have a means function, so we have a problem. Uh, but also 2015, uh, Boato and Collier, they published a paper on these point vortex dynamics, went and uh, have, a, have a result where they describe how the Hamiltonian changes when the metric changes. So we have two spheres. This is a normal sphere, let's say uh, one metric one, a Cleveland metric, and then we have this other sphere with a weird metric, G tilde. And, and they are related through a conformal factor. Bam, here, this conformal factor H squared. Uh, and what uh, Boat and Collier say is that 
you can express the new Hamiltonian as the old Hamiltonian minus a new term. And we will take advantage of this, because, but our bunny is not spherical, but we, can, we don't care because we can just make it spherical with a conformal map. And this conformal map will actually give us the conformal factors, because this is an accreted metric, this bunny. We distort it, we capture the distortion in the conformal factor, and then we can use this formula in order to express our velocity field using the new Hamiltonian and also the new symplectic gradient. The new symplectic gradient won't be this complicated because the conformal mappings still preserve 90 degrees rotation as usual. So, uh, as I said before, the symplectic gradient is basically a 90 degree rotation of the gradient, and this will still happen here. Uh, we only have to be careful that we scale the symplectic gradient as well by h squared. So we plug this in, bam, get this nice and long formula. This is basically spherical dynamics plus some extra term. Uh, and this is the final computation if you plug everything in and isolate it. Uh, and in, in action, it looks like this. And what, what is quite interesting, so let's go to the next slide to show this. Uh, we are actually doing all the dynamics on the sphere. Because this theorem was uh, for the sphere, for the, with a different metric. And then we pull back the result onto the bunny. So this is the, you can see the, every line here is, has a right angle of intersection, just like here, and which says that this is a conformal map. And in this sphere, we have a weird metric, and the point vortices are moving in this weird <coughs> metric. And what is very interesting is that the hurricane near the bunny's ear is self-inducing a velocity. And it's actually the one up here. You can see it's just spinning around itself around the ear. This is the ear has been shrunk very, very much, which makes the conformal factor very large, which also makes uh, numerical uh, action quite unstable. But uh, here's an example where we put some passive particles in. So this is sort of uh, the storm induced by these hurricanes. Uh, as you can see, uh, up here a lot of points are packed together and even the small numerical uh, overshooting will now create that the, the, all the points fly away of the year, but it's just a numerical issue. And on the, um, this is basically uh, the velocity field induced by these hurricanes onto, on the body. Uh, also interesting, if you put two point vertices close to each other, they will and with opposite vorticity, they will move along a geodesic. Uh, this is called Kimura's conjecture, and this is how it looks on the bunny, and this is how it looks on the sphere before being pulled back to the bunny. So it's basically doing some shifts depending on the gradient of the conformal factor. Uh, and this is another example uh, of a few leap, it's actually leapfrogging uh, point vortices. Uh, and pairs <coughs> along each other. Uh, and if you wondered how I got the conformal map, then there's this paper called the, uh, How to Modify uh, uh, Mean Curvature Flow to Make It Not Singular. And I basically flow the bunny into a sphere conformally, step by step, and use backwards orders to do that. And we can also map bananas and armadillos and bears to spheres, which is cool. And thank you so much for listening. So, question, question? So, you started by saying you don't look at the philosophy induced by vortex on itself. Yeah. So that we yeah. And then at the end, you said this. One of the bunnies here was using yes. motion itself. So yes, what, yes, what yes. Going on? That, that's right. Uh, the the motion induced on itself on the bunny's ear is uh, sort of the curvature effect. Uh, and what I what I meant is uh, the idea that you have there's there are basically two forces acting on, on this created by every point vertex. There's this uh, curvature dependent uh, shape dependent force that it exerts on itself. And then there is this close proximity force. Basically, um, the velocity induced right around this point actually uh, is infinity. 
basically ramps up, and we are just cutting off that part. But we are not cutting off the other effects that it has a self-inducing velocity. But yes, that's a that's a right. That that's this one doesn't violate the kinetic energy becoming infinite. Uh, if you this is only the other part, the one that tries to make it rotate around itself in its speed. Okay. So so if you had a single vortex on the body, yes. it might move. Uh, or uh, actually, no, because we want our uh, vorticity to sum to be oh, zero yeah. on the closed surface. Uh, yeah. So uh, you reduce your solution space to Navier's free space. Right? Sorry. You reduce your solution space to Navier's free space. Yes. So yeah. that you can get rid of the second equation in your space. Uh, yeah, yeah, but well, well, it didn't do it because of that. This is sort of extra point where these don't have divergence, uh, which is nice. But uh, yeah. And how do you get rid of the pressure? Because as far as I know, in turbulent flows, one yeah. of the biggest issues is the pressure is the one that creates the vortices, and yeah, and hence you need pressure robustness to make this thing. Yeah, uh, we we got rid of well, well basically what we, we we looked at this problem a bit different. We prescribed a vorticity. And then we looked for a velocity field that creates this vorticity. But again, even if you the vorticity, the vorticity yes. is time dependent. Yes. So as you move along the time, the vorticities will reduce. Yes. Basically. And hence, you are looking at a particular time for the vortex. Yeah. And in sense, you are removing the time uh, variation also of the problem. Yes, yes. So in some sense, you reduce three things. You reduce the divergence free, you reduce the pressure, and the time dependence yes. of the equation. Yeah, the thing, uh, this is also part of the point vortex that when I advect the velocity field, mm -hmm. I only advect the point. So I'm making another approximation again, saying that, oh, the next field will also be point vortices. So I'm basically, uh, if I would work to be more precise, then the next step would, I would need a different model because it's not point vortices anymore. But uh, because I do this approximation throughout at every time step, then I come back to the beginning where I just have this um, divergence-free, uh, irrotational velocity field everywhere. But in the long-term behavior, the forces yeah. should reduce to like one or two, right? The the what? The in the long-term <coughs> behavior, of the time. What? If I let this process go for infinite time, process. Yeah. What should reduce? The the amount of vortices. No, no, they stay constant. They stay constant. Yes, yeah, they stay constant all the time. There is also no merging of vortices, or when they come together, they start whirling up and become one vortex. This doesn't happen in this model, so it's very, very much simplified. There is, there are models where instead of point vortices, you basically take a smooth kernel of vorticity, and then also then you have to uh, approximate that at every step to keep the smooth kernel. If you want to be very precise, you could also. Uh, well, you need to take a smooth field otherwise, and, and because vorticity falls apart quite quickly. But in this model, we just try to keep it close, and this only happens when it's very concentrated, like in a hurricane, mm -hmm. when it's very much in one point, and then this approximation is valid. Normal fluid flows would have vorticity all over the place. So, Let's thank this video again.